It might have something to do with the recording up there. Yes, sir. <coughs> but uh, tell you what, now you may not know, I'll bring that up, you may not know that uh, we record now every Sunday morning. We were just recording the messages. <laughs> you know, I think we're missing the best part of the service, so I asked them to uh, start recording also the, our music. You know, we just have a wonderful band. And so uh, we got the equipment we needed for that. You know, to record my old voice, you don't need much because there's not much improvement that can be done. But uh, but uh, need a little better, need a bit of better equipment for uh, for vocals. And so, the reason I'm telling you all this is because will it be Tuesday when it goes on Facebook, Robert? Okay, Two, every Tuesday. The discourse, the, the discourse, yes. The music worship, we're still tweaking stuff. So. Okay, all right. Well, I hope you can get it on there. We're hoping. We're I hope you can get it on there. Because I'd a whole lot tell folks, a lot better tell folks listen to the music. <laughs> all right, I want to I wanna talk to you about something. You know, this is, we talked last week about New Year's resolutions. This is time for that. Have you ever said, well, I'll never do that again? That's got something that's said a lot around this time, isn't it? But you know, I found out a long time ago, it's best to never say never. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I found out, you know, I, as soon as I said I'll never do this or say this, bam, it happened. So, we find it in the Bible. And it's something we need to be careful about. You remember? You remember there was a, a fellow named Peter. And you remember he told Jesus one time, he said, I will never deny you. Boy, that sounded good at the time, didn't it? And what did Jesus say to him? He said, Peter, I tell you what. You're going to deny me three times before the sun shines again. And he did. And there was another fella. His name was Saul. Most of us know him as Paul. He became known as Paul after he became a Christian. But you know, well, just let me read you something here. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. Now, don't, don't worry about turning there, you know, because you may miss something here. Just listen, okay? Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Oh, he was an enemy of Christ. He hated the Christians. Listen to what he did. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if... He found any there who belonged to the way. That's what, that was the first name for Christians was the way. If you look in your Bible, way is capitalized. That was a proper name for them. If he found anyone who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly... A light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. I'm sure Saul before this said he would never become a Christian. In fact, he made it his job, he made it the passion in his life to persecute Christians. And yet, brother, you better never say never because he was on the road to Damascus to do what he said he was going to do to the Christians. And you know what? He had a little interruption. He met the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I will tell you something. I believe the reason we should never say never is not just because we many, many times have to eat crow because we find ourselves doing it. But you know what? I believe that if Saul had not obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ, 
I don't think he would have made another step toward Damascus. And we'll get into something here in a minute that I think we all need to know. There was another in the book of Acts, a couple. There was a couple in Acts chapter 5 named Ananias and Sapphira. Now I want to tell you something before I read this. I don't understand all this, why, why it happened this way, because let me tell you something. I've been guilty of the same thing, and you probably have too, that Ananias and Sapphira committed the sin that they committed. Let's read it, okay? Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Ladies, how'd you like to have a name like Sapphira? <laughs> well, that went over well. <laughs> and they sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, I tell you what, we, I think we've all been guilty of something like this. You know, we, maybe we say, you know, well, I'm wholeheartedly for Christ Jesus. I'm going to give him all I've got. I'm going to give him everything. He owns everything I've got, and yet we hold back, don't we? Well, there, it may not be my, I haven't got any money to hold back, so I don't have to worry about that. But how many times have we told Christ, have we, and played like in church, like we were giving our all to Christ Jesus, and we were not. And quite honestly, the reason we were doing it and saying that is because we wanted people to, oh, good boy, good boy, such a righteous, holy man. You know, our motivation is not exactly where it should be. And so that's what Ananias and Sapphira. Now, I don't know that that's what was their motivation because I don't know their heart. But we'll know one thing for sure. God sure does. Yeah. Listen to this. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Now, I don't know how, I don't know how Peter got wind of it. I mean, you know, God may have told him in a dream, God can do that. Uh, God may have told him in a prayer, I, uh, God can do that. But you know, it could have been something real simple. <laughs> I found out something else a long time ago. <clears throat> that if you tell someone a secret you have, it's no longer a secret. And it doesn't take long in society if you tell somebody a secret for it to get all the way around. And that could have been what happened. I don't know. You know, the fire, he told the fire and she went to the beauty shop. Mm -hmm. Either that or maybe Ananias went to the barber shop. Okay? There's just as much gossip in the barber shop as there is in the beauty shop. But I don't know. But Peter knew about it. And he said, how can you do this? And that's how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? He was not under any obligation to do any of this. What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Now, folks, this is serious stuff. Is it not? And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in. Not knowing what had happened, and Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. And Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet 
of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. Gee, Peter's probably going, you know, whenever he was up there by him, he's probably going, I'm going to move a little bit further away from those folks. Now, I want to tell you, now, now before we start saying, oh, boy, they were, they were terrible folks. But as I said, haven't we been guilty of some of the same things, same kind of sin? And yet, I think we're all here breathing and our hearts beating. What is the difference? I think this may be the difference, folks. I think what we need to realize is we never, ever want to get between God and what he is doing. God was doing something in the church of Jerusalem. And Ananias and Sapphira unfortunately got in the way of what God was doing. And folks, when God is ready to do something, he does it. I don't understand everything about it. I can't tell you, you know, that God has some kind of formula for when he gets ready to do something. But folks, I know this. We had better stay out of God's way whenever he decides to start doing something. I pastored a church in uh, East Texas at a place called Trinidad, Texas for a number of years. And uh, there was a little church out in the country and, and uh, it uh, uh, they got a new pastor and God decided to do something out there. I mean, you know what? That church was, you know, folks were being saved. They came coming to know Christ. The church was growing. Everything was going great. There were three men, though, in that church that did not like what the preacher was doing for whatever reason. Not that he wasn't doing anything wrong. I mean, you know, they just didn't like it. Maybe because, you know, he was, uh, this new preacher, you know, was, kind of spoiling their me, find, me, my four, and no more philosophy of church. You know, some people have that philosophy. If I can't be in control, if my family can't be in control, then no one is going to be in control. Folks, God must be in control. Yeah. And these three guys, and I and don't, don't read me wrong, I'm not saying that God did it. I'm not saying that at all. All I know is that these three guys, they had three funerals in six months' time. Folks, you don't want to get in the way of what God is doing. Okay? All right. Never, never come between God and what he's doing. Another thing we never want to do is we never want to question the way God is working. You can read in the New Testament there in the Gospels, Jesus kept saying over and over and over again that he had not come to rule from Jerusalem. The throne of David was, that was not what he came for at that point in time. Now, you know what? You can read Revelation and there's going to be a thousand years he ruled. But he wasn't talking about that. He kept on telling them that he had come and that he would suffer at the hands of the Jewish leaders that he would be crucified, he would die on the cross, and he would raise again the third day. He kept telling them and telling them and telling them. It's kind of, it was kind of like, you know, you ever tell your kids how things are going to be, and they just won't listen to you. Because, you know, they've got their agenda and their idea and what they want to do, and, it, you know, it, it just isn't going to work out unless they get their way. We call them spoiled. Don't we? And we all have some of those that if we have children. Well, that's the way the disciples were. Because, you know, that did not fit their agenda. What their agenda was is that Jesus was going to take over the government in Jerusalem, take it away from the Romans who were there ruling over them, and he was going to, at that time, sit in David's throne. They had their agenda. And, of course, it was... The reason why I believe they had this agenda was because, you know, uh, you know, we want to get in this deal while it's good. And we want to 
be there. And you know, when Jesus sits on the throne of David, we're going to be there with him. We're going to be his advisors. We're going to be head honchos and chief head rollers too. Folks, God does not always work the way we think he should work. God does not jump through hoops for me and you. And we never should question the way God is working. Oh, I've been, I, I've said, I, I've told God, I said, God, I don't know what you're doing. And I'm sure you thought that or said that too. But you know what I've come to realize? is God is not dependent on me to understand what he's doing to do what he does. And you know, the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. And so when we don't understand God, what he's doing, that's the time we need to start walking in faith because we don't see everything that God is doing. And we certainly do not understand everything that God is doing. Why? Why did you do that, God? Well, you know what? I, we may not know. This side of glory, this side of heaven, we may not know. But never question the way God is working. And then the third thing that I think we need to remember, and that is this. We need to remember that we should never underestimate the power of God. 1 Corinthians 6 and 14 says, By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Now, I want, to, I, want, I want to ask you something. Do any of you know any other Savior that has come into the world that died and that rose from the dead? There is none other other than Jesus Christ. And, you know, that should tell us something. That should tell us that there is no power in this universe above the power of God. Because when God the Father raised God the Son from the dead, you know what? The only other power, and the power that we contend against, Satan, the power, the God of this world, Jesus said it, I didn't say it, the God of this world did everything he could to keep Jesus in that grave. But you know what? The power of God is greater than the power of Satan or anything else. And Satan could not keep Jesus in the tomb. In the grave. So we as Christians should never underestimate the power of God. And I say that because how many times have we said, I've been guilty of, God, why don't you do something? God, it's time for you to do this God stuff. Well, you know, who am I to tell God when he should act and do something? Think about that. Now, I'm going to share just a few things with you, and then we'll close. Some things we should remember this year. One, God's timing is perfect. Now, God's timing, and God's time is not always our time. These are two different things. But God's timing is always perfect. You can search the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and you will see that God's timing is always perfect. Number two, God sees the whole picture. The Bible says that God sees the end, and he saw the end from the very beginning of time. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10 says, I am God, there, there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. 
I say my purpose will stand, and listen to this, and I will do all that I please. We need to recognize that, folks. God will do what he pleases. The wonderful thing is, is that what God pleases is always what's best for us. The Bible says that. Number three, God has total recall. He never forgets. How many times have you said, oops, I forgot that? I forgot about that. I do it all the time. I'm always forgetting something. Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then Romans 11, verses 33 through 36, listen to this. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? In other words, <coughs> God's never borrowed from anybody. He owns it all. Far from him and through him. Listen to this. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. You know, whenever I discovered all this, uh, it sure did take a burden off of me. <clears throat> when I finally figured out that it did not depend on me, it took a lot of a burden off of me. Because, you know, before that, because I was a preacher, I thought that, you know, if this church failed, or any church failed that I pastored, it was my fault, you know? The buck always, always, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the pastor here. But you know what? I might be the pastor here, but I'm not the head honcho. God is. And God's going to do what pleases him. He's going to work. I remember one time a guy called me and said, hey, we heard about what you're doing. I wasn't doing anything. He said, he said, he got this right. He said, God's working and we want to get in on it. God's working. Let's just go along for the ride. Let's just say like Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6, even, even so, Lord, send me. I'm just your servant. But let's never forget that we are servants. He is in control. Never get in God's way. Never underestimate the power of God. And never question the way God's working. Now I have an assignment for you this week. I want to, for you to go to your Bible and pray. Every day, go to your Bible and pray and ask God to show you how he has control of this world and of your life. And you know, your life will be a lot better when you realize that God is in control. Even whenever it looks like it's out of control to you and me. God is still in control. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for your word. Heavenly Father, <laughs> I just get so excited <clears throat> when I realize that how unworthy I am, and yet you still, still want to, to work through me. <laughs> help me to never forget and help this congregation to never forget. It's not me. It's you. And you have chosen to work through us. 
and how privileged we are just to be along for the ride. Thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. We'll see you next Sunday, okay?